Here, thanks for having me back, which is nice. It's easy to, it's easy to speak somewhere once, it's, it's coming back, that's the problem, right? So uh, it's great you guys have me back again, which is fantastic. So kia ora lovely to be here with you guys, and we're going to have a great time as we jump into part three of this great series. And welcome in also to everyone online today. I uh, hope you guys enjoy this as well. So the little big life, hopefully by now you've kind of caught what this is about. It's all about the power of little things done consistently to position us so that God can use us in significant ways. You know, so often in life, right, we're looking for the big moments, the big opportunities, the big breakthroughs, the big answered prayers. But it's easy for us to forget that for those that first followed Jesus that we read about in the scriptures, those things that happened came out of the practice of small habits, small disciplines in a consistent way that enabled God to use them when he needed to. Like a key in a door, the little often unlocks, unlocks the big. Right. And today we're going to look at a really pivotal habit, I think. Pivotal habit and core practice uh, that is so important in building the church. In fact, to think of the church flourishing without this practice is simply inconceivable. Uh, and I'm going to jump in at the beginning, right back in Genesis, as we climb into this together today. So come on. Come with me on this. Genesis 2.18. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. What's God saying? God's saying that this person that I created, actually, it's not good for him to be alone, to be isolated, to be by himself. God's not, not like taking a hit at, at having a bit of alone time or, or you know, taking some time out. That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is the fact that togetherness is a core human need. In fact, we're not even fully representing the image of God until we are in some way together, right? That is such an important thing for us to realize today. I mean, think about it. How do we most severely punish someone, for example, who's in prison? We put them in solitary confinement. That says something to us, right? That's really important. The problem of emotional and physical isolation from other human beings is a massive issue in our world today. And it's so weird, right? Because what we've seen for for the last thousand years is this urban drift, the movement uh, of of people towards cities to live in large communities. And yet if I said, hands up if you know the names of your neighbors on both sides of your house, I bet there'd be a whole stack of us who would have no idea. Human beings need others. We are made in the image of God. Babies die without human contact. Actually, so do adults. It's just slower. We are social beings. We're not just physical, mental, and spiritual. We're also social beings. That's how God made us because we are made in the image of a triune God. Listen to this. Pastor Kate Wharton, a single woman and a minister, writes, ever since God declared that it was not good for Adam to be alone, human beings have been living alongside one another, sharing life together. She says, I need other people in my life. I need them to offload to after a bad day. I need them to work alongside in meaningful ministry. I need them to share a bottle of wine with as we put the world to rights. I need them to point out to me the parts in my character that I need to work on. I need them to celebrate with me when good things happen. I need them to spend some of my days off and holidays with. I need them to give me a hug and tell me everything's going to be okay. We need to regulate it and habitually spend time with others. Let me go to Hebrews now. Hebrews chapter 10, 23. And this is where we're gonna spend most of our time today. Let us hold unswervingly, the author writes, to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on to love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now let me give you a bit of context for this. The author of Hebrews before this literally writes chapters on the supremacy of Christ, the the power and importance of what he did on the cross, the astonishing spiritual impact of the blood of Jesus and what he purchased for us not only to deal with sin, but also to seal once for all this new covenant between God and each one of us to give us freedom and confidence in God. I mean, that stuff is massive. Like it's huge, right? 
to, to, to really grasp in some way, shape, and what Jesus has done for us. But then what he does, and then he kind of shifts gear and he gives us instructions for us in terms of now how we live out of that place. Here's what he says. You've got to, basically, says you've got to stay positive. Like he, he, he's faithful, so stay positive. When things don't look good, stay positive. Have hope. Unswervingly hold to that. Like that's a decision that we have to make. He goes on and talks about because of what Jesus has done, we've got to love one another, we've got to encourage one another, and we've got to do good things to bless one another. And in the middle of that, he says, and don't stop meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Now, this is interesting because, you know, we're talking about habits, the things that we do that are constructive for us. But here, the author is also raising a habit we can find ourselves slipping into, which is destructive for us. The habit of giving up on meeting together, which does the opposite of positioning us for big things. Now, let me clarify this. I believe everything has a season. Every church has a season. Every small group has a season. Every set of relationships to some degree have a season in life. I'm not saying you have to stay in the same small group till Jesus returns and if things have fallen apart, you know, then, then you deep in sin. That's not what we're saying at all. But here's the thing. Some people give up yeah. on groups. Some people give up on journeying with others. Some people give up on being around challenging people. And they do that repeatedly. Look, if a relationship or a group or, look, honestly, even a church, actually, if it's destructive and toxic to you, man, you need to move on. Yeah. Yeah. There are necessary endings in life. However... If you're doing it because it's a bit awkward or because it's a bit uncomfortable or because it's a bit challenging, then that is a habit that you need to address in your life and replace it or else in the end, it will sideline you in God's kingdom. You know, the German theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. And the more deeply he becomes involved in it, the more disastrous is his isolation. Togetherness is unbelievably important. And we just need to accept that. Togetherness is the context for these three instructions that the author of Hebrews gives us, right? Christians, we are called to love, like to to really make that a priority in our lives. Like 1 Corinthians 13, right? We think it's the wedding scripture. Like, have you ever been to a wedding and not heard 1 Corinthians 13? In fact, if you didn't have 1 Corinthians 13 at your wedding, I'm not even sure if you're married, I'm gonna be honest. You know, like, but but, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 was never written for, for weddings. You know, if you can prophesy, if you have all wisdom and all knowledge, and if you have the faith that can move mountains, but you don't have love, you are nothing. I mean, do you hear what, do you hear what the author is saying? Paul's saying, man, you can have that kind of faith, man. You can shuck them high and prophesy and read everybody's mail, and you can have all that down. You can know everything, have all the answers for everything. You have the faith, you pray, and just stuff changes, and people are healed. And God is saying, you have all of that, but if it actually doesn't come from love, like real love, then your scorecard is a big fat zero. Like that should, that should freak us out a little bit. Because particularly because we're Pentecostal, right? Now we love the signs and wonders. We love the healing. We love the prophecy. We love that stuff. And God's saying, all good stuff, but actually if it doesn't come from love, you are utterly missing the point. And I would much rather have love than all of those things. And in fact, we see that in Matthew chapter seven. You know, so... So love, good things, encouraging. But how can I encourage someone if I'm never with somebody? How can I love someone really if I won't make time to be with them? How do I do something good for someone and bless them in meaningful ways if I won't turn up? So these these practices are really important. Now, the challenge can be sometimes, right, is that we can find ourselves going, eh, I don't think I'm getting anything from this group anymore. And, And can I suggest that if if that's kind of where you found yourself thinking, maybe it's time for us to change our consumer mindset and come together to give more than receive. And I promise you this, that will radically change your experience of community. So we've got to come together, first of all, right, to encourage one another. First Thessalonians 5, 10, and 11. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, 
we may live together with him, therefore encourage one another. We should be the most encouraging people in our world. Our homes and our churches should be the most encouraging places. Listen to this. The goal of encouragement is not to make someone feel good, it's to make someone feel brave. Encourage means literally to put courage into someone so that then they can go out and step out and face their life and all of the things they've got in it with just a little bit more courage, a little bit more bravery. Remember that when you come to encourage somebody. You know, when I was a young man, the age of um, 22 got saved, I had shocking self-esteem. In the church, I went to Elam Church in Dunedin, and I got involved in this young adults group, and there was this couple that used to have the young adults round to their place um, every week. And, and every time I'd rock up there, this guy, Bill, Bill would always encourage me. He'd say, Mike, you're, you're a great guy, Mike. Gosh, it's so good seeing you, Mike. You're awesome. After a while, he used to really tick me off, because I'm like, bro, you don't know me, and I'm not awesome. But you know what happened? Despite my best efforts to push it off, after a year of sitting under his encouragement, I was different. How I felt about myself was different. I tell you, his weekly habit of encouraging me changed me. Can I say to you, if you have a weekly habit of encouraging somebody, you will change them. It is a powerful thing. That's part of why we have to come together and encourage one another. Secondly, we've got to love people. I, I touched on this before, but you know, we've got to learn to see people, like see people and love them. I love in, in, Matthew, sorry, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus with the rich young ruler, it says this. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. How often do we look at people and never see them? Right. I remember this time when I was studying, this is many years ago, this is actually before I was a Christian. I remember coming out of a university class one time and I got into a brief conversation with, with, with a person who was in the class with me and, and I said to her, so how are you? And she said, good. But as I looked, there was just something that just wasn't good and so I simply repeated the question. They're gonna say, no, how are you? And her eyes just filled up with tears and started spilling down her cheeks. She said to me, no one has ever asked me that actually wanting to know. And we, we talked briefly and she assured me that she was fine but she was deeply impacted by the fact that I cared enough to ask twice. Can I suggest that maybe sometimes some of us need to learn to care enough to ask twice? God might just touch someone powerfully through you. The third thing that we, we do in our togetherness is that we do good deeds for one another. We do good things. Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, listen to this, right? For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Now, we're not saved by good works, but we're changed and we're impacted to be a force for good wherever we are, right? Acts of kindness, acts of generosity, actions to help people, serve people, acts of caring faith to pray for somebody, to bless somebody, to build somebody up. I remember after we'd had, uh, when we had Ali, our, our first child, our first daughter, um, we got involved in this antenatal group and it was great. We made some great relationships with some of those people in that group. And there was one particular couple we kind of hung out with for several years after that antenatal group. And I remember they were around at our place one, one afternoon we were catching up and she was an athlete, and, but she had chronic debilitating back pain. And as they left to go, I just kind of stepped in and I said, hey, look, can I pray for you? She goes, yeah, sure. And so I stepped up close to her, closed my eyes, put my hands on her back and just prayed for her and asked that God would heal her. Now, when I opened my eyes, I could see that I'd done something wrong. Like she was like wide-eyed and looking stressed and they quickly left. And I thought, oh my gosh, what have I done? You know, like I, I've overstepped, I, I made a mistake, I've blown this. They weren't Christians. And so that afternoon I rang them and I asked to speak to her and I just apologized. I said, look, I'm so sorry. I guess, you know, being a Christian, I'm just, I'm kind of used to doing that. I forget that you aren't used to doing that. And she interrupted me. She says, no, 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 you don't understand. She says, I was so touched that you not only cared enough, but you also believed enough to actually pray for me then. I was so overwhelmed, I just didn't know how to respond. Do something good for someone and leave the results to God, amen? And can I say that there are people in our community that may not make it if we don't learn to do togetherness well. We have widows and widowers in our church, in our congregation, who are having lost their spouse, 
They don't get seen anymore. They don't get touched anymore. These ones need the care and the hugs of family like what we are. We have single people and same-sex attractive people of all ages who are trying to live their best life and live faithful to God, and they need the encouragement and the companionship of their church family. We have couples and parents who are struggling with the curveballs that life throws at them, and they're trying to have faith that things can get better, that things could turn around in their marriage or with their kids, and they need church family to give them hope and to be a safe place where they can vent and process. We have young people caught up with groups and individuals that are just not good for them. And they need youth groups and events like our upcoming encounter camp where they can find God and find friends who are going in the same direction. But none of this happens unless we make it a habit to meet together. Look, some people have a habit of meeting together in church, in the cafe. Afterwards, they sit down, they hang out there for an hour. Awesome. That is fantastic. Some people make a habit of, of being a part of a small group or even more than one small group and having some food together and some laughs and maybe digging into the word. Awesome. It doesn't matter how you do it. You just need a habit of it. We've got to be intentional because if we are honest, the problem is that meeting together isn't always easy, right? We're all different, man. We click better with some people than others. Some people inspire us and some people just annoy us. And yet nowhere does it say in the scriptures that they continued to meet daily with the ones they particularly liked. (laughs) As helpful as that would have been if it was in the scriptures. You know, I had had this small group that I met together with for a couple of years, years ago in Dunedin. Uh, I haven't often been in a group with so many people that annoy me uh, as I was with this group. This was a group of, of some people who couldn't kind of find their way into another group, and so I kind of gathered them together. We had an ex-gang member with an extremely pronounced lisp that seemed to get worse when he got really angry, which he seemed to do regularly in small group. And when you've got a very angry small group leader lisping, it, it's kind of like a comedy show, and I literally had to just look at the floor so I didn't burst out laughing, because if I laughed, I was pretty sure he would have killed me then there was a woman who had a whole range of issues and she would just sit there in the chair the entire time just rocking back and forth the whole time honestly after 45 minutes I'm seasick I I just had to go lay down somewhere it was unbelievable then there was this guy who had a whole range of mental challenges who would often doze off and when asked the question because I would have to ask him questions to keep him awake and so I would ask him questions and he would respond every time with a long monologue in which he jammed together all of his theology, I guess hoping that somewhere in there it would answer my question. Like I might say to him something like, so what does it mean to you that Jesus loves the world? And he would go, well, and he would always start with this. Well, Mike, he goes, you know me. He'd always say, you know me. And then it would begin, you know me, I, I love God. And he came for us and he came for us in the ark. And in the ark, they came together two by two with 40 loaves and 40 fishes. And then the whale came and ate them all. But then the whale vomited them out because they were neither hot nor cold. And they arrived at Jericho. And then Nehemiah rebuilt the wall. And then Jesus came down with Daniel and the lions. And together they went through the fire with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And then they all ate 40 loaves and Jesus reached out his hand and healed them. In Jesus' name. And do you know what? There is no way to answer that. And so we just move on. However, there was one other member we had. And this member, he was the guy who was on the spectrum. He had a photographic memory. He he memorized whole chapters of the Bible. But when this guy would do this monologue... He hated it. He hated it. And he would start yelling at this guy. You can't say that. That's not what happened. That's ridiculous. And while this guy's kept going, then he'd turn and start yelling at me. You got to say something. You're the leader of the group. You got to correct him. And I'm like, bro, I don't even know where to begin. (laughs) Honestly, it was a circus. One guy lisping and getting angry and a woman rocking back and forward and just watching everything. And one guy monologuing and mixing up every Bible story you ever heard. And there's another guy jumping in and yelling at me and yelling at him. It was unbelievable. And I did this weekly for about two years. (laughs) 
Did I tell you I've just had my 21st birthday? Do I look older than that? <laughs> and people would say to me, they would say to me, why do you bother? And I bothered because being with these people brought me perspective more than anything else I did. Because every week with these guys, I was reminded that I was no more special than they were. Because I knew that the Bible said that he loved them exactly the same amount as he loved me. And then in James 1, it says that true Christianity is loving the orphans and the widows, the isolated and the alone. And every week, I would spend time with these people and be reminded that God doesn't love me any more than them. And it was powerful and deeply humbling, and I believe I got more out of it than they did. There are plenty of times I didn't want to turn up. Plenty of times I didn't want to have to get in my car because none of them can drive, and I've got to go driving all around the city, picking them all up, and then taking them there, and then, then going through purgatory and paying for my sins for an hour and a half, and then, and then dropping them all back home again. But I did it anyway, and I'm so glad I did. It was a powerful season in my life. You remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago in Acts chapter 2, verse 42? It says they devoted themselves to these habits. They devoted themselves. And we looked two weeks ago at the meaning of the word devoted. How in the Greek it has nothing to do with how you feel about it. That the word devoted literally means to stick to, to persevere in seriously, strongly, and consistently. It means that they did it whether or not they felt like it. It was a habit they stick to because it mattered. And this approaching life together is such a critical part of the puzzle of the Christian life. God blesses us when we get together in his name. It makes a difference, it builds the church, and it profoundly affects us. We'll get the team to come now as we come to a close. You know, I heard the story of a church, uh, a rural church led by a young minister who who uh, really made a point of following his people up, and he had an older couple in the church, and, and the wife, uh, after a long illness, died, and the, and the husband, this older man, man, it, it was obviously a, an incredibly tough time for him, and, and he just came to church less and less until he stopped coming at all. And the minister tried to call and tried to connect with him to no avail. So after several months, the minister just thought, oh, he was just gonna go see him. It was a bitterly cold day. He rocked up at the door and knocked on it, after a few moments, he heard the man shuffling across the floor. The door opened, and the old man looked at him and just said, Ah, oh, it's you. Then he turned and walked back to his chair by the fire. Well, you better come in, he said, reluctantly. The pastor hesitated, then walked through the door, closed it behind him, hung up his coat, and went and sat in the other chair positioned in front of the fire. He said nothing, and neither did the man. Many minutes went by, and then finally the pastor got to his feet. He picked up the poker from beside the fire, and he, he stuck it in the fire, which is a burning heap of coals, and he, and he just separated out one of the coals, and he moved it about 20 centimeters away from the rest of the fire. And then he sat down, and they continued to stare into the fire. Over the next few minutes, that coal, now separated, slowly cooled until it changed color and stopped burning, went from a, a glowing orange to a dull black. The minister just sat there for another couple of minutes. Then he got to his feet again, picked up the poker again, and then nudged the coal back hard up against the rest of the fire and sat down again. In seconds, that coal burst back into flame and its color slowly changed from black back to a warm orange pastor sat there in silence for a few more moments, thanked the man for allowing him to come in, got to his feet, went to the door, put on his coat and opened the door to leave. As he opened the door, the man sitting in the chair said in a low voice, pastor, thanks for the sermon. I'll see you on Sunday. When we no longer meet, we lose our head. Together, we burn brightly. Can I challenge you this morning? For those of us who are uh, meeting together with others regularly, that's an awesome thing. Can I encourage you to make sure that you're turning up with a heart to give, to sow, to be a part of pouring into others. 
For those of you who have let go of meeting together because you haven't been getting much out of it, can I encourage you to try it again, but really go in with a different intent this time. For those who have been burned, and probably we all have, eh? every one of us at some point, been burned or been disappointed or been let down and who have stopped meeting together, maybe it's time to try again. There is something powerful and big that happens when we make a habit of getting together regularly. It's how the kingdom is built. Amen. Let me just pray. Mighty God, I thank you. It's again for your astonishing word, Lord, and just the richness of what's in there for us. God, as we look at, at, at those ones who followed you right back at the beginning, right, and we look at their habits and look at what they did consistently, whether they felt like it or not. God, these the, the small, ordinary practices, but God, we see that they, that they were positioned for you to do great things through them. And I pray, God, for us, that as we lean into this habit of getting together, God, that we, as we commit ourselves afresh for a new day, a new season, a new chapter, God, I pray that you will surprise us with the things that you do in us and through us. Be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name.